Good evening, perfect. everybody, and welcome all of you to the live program number 120 at Orthopedic Principles. Today, we have faculty, distinguished speaker, Dr. Mandi Burke from New NYU Lagoon Health Center, New York, United States. Dr. Burke is board certified fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon specializing in open and arthroscopic treatment of shoulder and elbow conditions. After graduating from the University of College of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, he completed an orthopedic residency and research at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. He received advanced training in the management of shoulder and elbow at the Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Dr. Work has won numerous awards, including the Ludwig Fighter MS Research Paper Distinction Award, Asir Award, our Best Research Paper Award, the Chitanujan Radawat Award, and the Kawasos Residency Fellowship Award. Dr. Work is the section's editor for the shoulder and elbow sections of techniques in orthopedics. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Mandeep Work from New York, United States. Over to you, Mandeep. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm deserving of that lengthy introduction, but uh, today uh, we are going to talk about uh, a very common thing that uh, you will see in elbow, uh, it's uh, elbow stiffness. So we will go over uh, the etiology, the clinical presentation and treatment, and then follow it by outcomes and complications. Uh, you guys can ask me questions in the middle, I don't mind. Uh, so elbow joint, the function of uh, elbow is to position the hand in space. Uh, you know, it's a synovial joint, which has three compartments, the ulnohumeral, the radiocapitellar, and proximal radio ulna joint. So when we describe uh, elbow in terms of range of motion, you know, elbow has a reasonable range of motion ranging anywhere from hyperextension to around 140 to 150 degrees of flexion and a supination pronation typically of 90 and 90. But when we talk about elbow in a functional range of uh, motion standpoint, we're usually talking about a flexion extension arc of 100 degrees and a supination pronation arc of 100 degrees, which means that if you have a normal functioning shoulder and wrist, you will be able to do majority of activities of daily living with this range of motion. And this is typically a clinical goal as well. Uh, the flexion extension arc is typically 30 to 130 or 20 to 120, and supination pronation is usually 50 of supination and 50 of uh, pronation. And again, supination is more uh, important uh, for a lot of uh, activities. Elbow joint uh, uh, as a joint is very prone to stiffness. It typically will take up an attitude of flexion and pronation when it gets stiff. Uh, and there are multiple reasons for why uh, elbow is more prone to stiffness than other joints. It has a preferential capsular response, which means in response to either synovitis or injury, there's selective thickening of the anterior capsule, which is more thick and robust compared to the posterior capsule. And uh, all the collateral ligaments and sagittal plane, they are more anteriorly directed than posteriorly. So uh, there's a natural tendency to uh, go into flexion. The anatomy itself is complex, as I told you, composed of three compartments. So any kind of uh, intra-articular malalignment or stiffness is poorly tolerated because you need a real uh, a competitive interaction between these compartments in order to get your final range of motion. And then again, the muscles, especially the brachialis, they are uh, very prone to heterotopic ossification and myostatic contracture. And uh, all these... Uh, uh, causes together make elbow a very common joint for stiffness. From uh, the ETI perspective, the causes can be extraarticular, extraarticular or combined. Uh, myofibroblast uh, is the key player uh, in uh, capsular contraction. When we look at the etiology, there are certain uh, peculiar uh, uh, aspects that can be seen in different conditions. So most of the time you'll see stiffness either secondary to post-traumatic condition or as a part of elbow arthritis or as a part of inflammatory arthritis. So when it's post-traumatic, apart from standard uh, findings like capsular thickening, you will also see articular incongruity or intra-articular stiffness which uh, requires a different kind of a treatment compared to elbow arthritis, in which you'll see more of uh, osteophyte formation, loose bodies, obliteration of the radial coronoid and olecran. Then inflammatory in which there'll be more infl inflammation 
actually see more of uh, instability changes from the quality. So when we uh, see a patient with elbow stiffness, they typically will present with uh, one of one or more of these four symptoms: typically pain, limitation of range of motion, presence of locking episodes, and symptoms of ulnar neuritis or compression neuropathy. So when we look at pain, we really want to differentiate: is this a pain from more of an inflammatory component, or is this a pain more from a mechanical component? So when you're examining a patient, if they have pain more at extreme of range of motion, that typically points to a mechanical cause. So they will typically say that, uh, doc, listen, I, I, I don't have much pain at rest, but when I'm throwing a ball at the release phenomenon, I get this little jerk and pain at the back of my elbow. Whereas patient who has an inflammatory condition and is stiff, and they'll be complaining pain throughout the arc of motion. The second uh, most common symptom is limitation of range of motion. And uh, flexion extension arc is more commonly compromised compared to a supination pronation arc. And uh, flexion extension, as we know, is more of, uh, of ulnohumeral and radiocapitellar pathology compared to supination pronation, which is more of a radio ulnar pathology. When a patient presents with locking episodes, they it is more indicative of presence of loose bodies. They won't have much pain during routine activities, but once in a while they'll have their elbow locked in. And uh, then they have to shake it off in order to uh, get past the locking episode. And that is typical of loose bodies, either typically in the posterior compartment, less so in the anterior compartment. And then symptoms of uh, ulnar neuritis or looking for signs of compression neuropathy. Patients will complain of pain radiating uh, on the ulnar aspect of the forearm and, and ulnar two fingers, or looking for in your examination signs of tenel sign or any muscle atrophy or weakness distally, typically the intrasia or the ADM. Again, when you're examining the patient, you're looking for prior scars to see if they have had surgery, especially ulnar sided scars. You want to make sure if they have had a prior ulnar transposition or if they have presence of hardware. In imaging, for me, typically, uh, I start with x-rays. I usually go for three views. Uh, and uh, But if you have severe elbow contracture, you may need uh, to have split AP views in which you get one AP view for distal humerus and you get one AP view for uh, proximal forearm in order to see uh, the anatomy better. Uh, you can add other views like radio capitella or coronoid views uh, if you're looking for anything uh, in particular like a malunion or things like that. One, th one important thing, uh, you may not see uh, loose bodies that are purely cartilaginous on an x-ray. And uh, typically in these patients, the rest of the joint looks pretty good. But uh, on clinical examination, patients complaining of a lot of mechanical pain a lot of locking and you look at the x-ray and you say like, uh, geez, uh, this guy does not have much pathology, but his symptoms a lot more. So those would be the cases in which I will definitely go for an advanced imaging just to prove uh, that they have something that is contributing to their uh, symptoms. I do get CT scan for all patients who are undergoing uh, surgery. It's more for preoperative planning. Can I do surgery without a CT scan? Surely. But I think uh, from an academic standpoint and uh, as an educational exercise, plus the advantages that CT gives me is uh, lets me know how congruent the joint is. I can locate the gutter osteophytes better. I can make sure that I can uh, look for loose bodies and actually count them and make sure that I'm gonna be taking them out if I'm doing arthroscopic uh, procedure in entirety and not losing anything behind. So this is what my typical preoperative plan sheet looks like in the operating room. I will have an AP and a an, uh, lateral view. Then I typically will put three dimensional uh, uh, CT images from the front, back uh, and the sides. And again, I am uh, making note of uh, cuts at the ulnohumeral level, radiocapitellar level, right in the center, a coronal view, a, a, a axial view for the superior radial ulnar joint and then an axial view at the uh, distal humerus. I'm looking for loose bodies. I don't know if you guys can see my arrow here or the pointer. Uh, I'm looking for coronoid uh, osteophyte, olecranon osteophyte, and then 
In the middle panel on the far left, you can see how uh, bone has filled in to the olecranon fossa, how the bone has obliterated the coronoid fossa and the radial fossa. So this is all the pathology that you're gonna be addressing. And it's good to know upfront what you're gonna be dealing in the preoperative, uh, what you're gonna be dealing in the operating room. So coming to the treatment, uh, the initial treatment, uh, especially when you're dealing with synovitis or stiffness or in early post-surgical phases, the treatment is non-surgical. It is really, as I mentioned, successful in soft tissue contractures, works well if you are addressing the pathology in first six months of onset. For pain and swelling, I typically will use compression sleeves, ice, anti-inflammatory medications. I do use uh, intraarticular steroid injections, especially for inflammatory arthritis or uh, inflammatory synovitis or in patients uh, who have a lot of pain but not necessarily mechanical symptoms. Everybody goes on a structured rehab uh, or a home exercise program, typically active range of motion, weighted stretches that patients can learn to do at home on their countertops or some of the things that uh, I will do as a part of non-surgical treatment. Then comes the splinting. I do splinting mainly in my post-op patients. And uh, there are two kinds of splintings that are popular. One is the static splinting, which is more popular and I think more commonly used. It involves usually using some sort of a brace that uh, allows a passive progressive stretch for anywhere between two to three hours in the morning and in the evening. You can address flexion in the morning, extension in the evening, or vice versa, depending upon your uh, preference. And static splinting is based on stress relaxation. Compared to dynamic splinting, which is more arduous, 23 hours, you are stretching. It's less well, well tolerated, and uh, it is based on the principle of creep and is not very popular among patients. Lastly, manipulation under anesthesia. For me, uh, the indications for manipulation under anesthesia typically is when I'm dealing with uh, post-op stiffness from fracture care. Usually within six months or so when I feel like the fracture is healed and patient is stiff, and I think uh, manipulation under anesthesia works really well. Or uh, in patients who have purely soft tissue contractures and not any major mechanical impingement. Literature shows that you can get an average gain of around 25 degrees or more, especially in flexion extension arc. You really can't do much for supination, pronation, arc recovery through manipulation. And again, flexion is more easy to achieve compared to extension. And uh, when I do uh, this, um, when I do manipulation under anesthesia for trauma, I make sure that manipulation is done prior to removal of the hardware. You don't want to take the hardware out and then predispose or risk yourself to a pathologic or iatrogenic fracture. Uh, I think most of the time uh, when I'm doing manipulation under anesthesia, a classic case for me is an olecranon fracture. Patient has been in four to six months out, fracture is healed, they're feeling great, and they have kind of like a flexion arc from 30 to 110 or 120. And I really feel it is more of intraarticular adhesions, more so than anything else. They don't have any other signs of arthritis. These, uh, this is a subset of patient that I'll take to the operating room or even now uh, you can do it in the office if you want to inject them, but uh, I would rather do it in the operating room. And if they want, uh, if I feel like uh, my hardware prominence could be playing a role, or if I'm worried about any screw that could be very close to the uh, intraarticular surface and I want to do hardware removal concomitantly, then uh, it, it'll be an indication for me. So a typical olecranon fracture with stiffness is what I do for MUA. Now let's talk about uh, real deal, the surgical treatment. So surgical treatment for elbow stiffness is typically an uh, elbow contracture release. Uh, it can be done open or orthoscopic. Other reconstructive uh, procedures that are uh, used are interposition orthoplasty and total elbow, which is more of a treatment of arthritis which does present as uh, elbow stiffness, but today's talk, we're gonna just focus on uh, the contracture releases. So when do I do uh, surgery for elbow stiffness? So if patient has a flexion extension arc less than 30 to 120 degrees, if patient's complaining of pain at the extreme of range of motion, which tells me that this is a 
mechanical pain that I can make better. And uh, it's very reproducible and very responsive to surgical treatment. If I see sources of mechanical impingement like loose bodies, if I see osteophytes on the olecranon or on the coronoid or obliteration of the fossa where I feel I can not only relieve their pain, but I can also improve their range of motion. So before you embark on surgical treatment, there are certain prerequisites and most importantly are the first top two. You need to have a congruent joint with an adequate joint space. You can't do this for a bone on bone or a terminal uh, elbow arthritis. It's not gonna fetch you much. You don't wanna do it on an inflammatory arthritis unless you are exclusively doing for removing some loose bodies which are less common in inflammatory arthropathy. And then foremost, patient has to be willing to participate in a structured rehab program, which is very essential because it takes a good uh, three to six months of uh, intensive rehab for you to get the good results that were achieved inside the operating room. Uh, the other uh, is good soft tissue coverage, more for trauma cases. And then again, uh, especially if you're dealing with HO, this is more of a controversial indication not controversial, but debatable indication where, uh, you know, typically we say that uh, you want the active inflammation in HO to subside, and it, it can take up to anywhere between nine months to a year for that to happen. But lately, I think there's more push for go in early, more so like three months or so, if you do see the HO on an x-ray, and there isn't much to wait for a longer time point. So principles of elbow contracture release, no matter what you do, whether you do arthroscopic or open, uh, there are certain principles that you should adhere to and they're pretty simple. You wanna release or excise contracted tissue and you wanna get rid of uh, bony impingement. So I typically tell residents there are four things in the front and four things in the back that I wanna do. I wanna excise the capsule. I wanna recreate the olecranon, the radial and the coronoid fossils. I wanna remove the loose bodies and remove the osteophytes, especially at the olecranon tip, the coronoid and the gutters. And then I wanna release any, uh, and I wanna do a tenolysis to uh, release any tricep adhesion to the back of the humerus and brachialis to the front of the humerus. In certain circumstances, if you're dealing with HO, you have to excise that. And then the last piece, the ulnar, which actually is really very important. And uh, if uh, you feel based on your preoperative uh, examination and history that all the nerve uh, has, uh, is compromised or there are symptoms of neuritis or uh, compression neuropathy, that we're gonna release it with or without transposition. So let's look at uh, uh, two scenarios. So if we wanna improve elbow flexion, we know that the structures at the back are tight and we have some sort of a block in the front. So we wanna remove the post tight posterior and posterolateral capsule. We wanna release the triceps. In the front, we wanna remove the mechanical block that comes from the coronoid. We wanna recreate the radial and coronoid fossa. And then if there are severe flexion contractures, we wanna release the posteromedial capsule. This thing is gonna be reversed when we're dealing with improving elbow extension. We know if we wanna improve extension, there are structures that are tight in the front and there is some sort of a block at the back. <clears throat> so we wanna remove the tight anterior capsule. We wanna release brachialis adhesions to the anterior surface of uh, the humerus. Posteriorly, we're gonna remove olecranon osteophyte we're gonna recreate the olecranon fossa and we're gonna remove loose bodies from the posterior fossa. So again, four things in the front, four things in the back. So now, as I mentioned, uh, that this can be done either open or orthoscopic. And uh, I think it's a uh, surgeon's comfort level that should dictate what they wanna do. There's no doubt that orthoscopic approach has less morbidity compared to open. And it is particularly suited for mild to moderate deformities or if you're exclusively dealing with uh, loose bodies, it's a quick operation. But there's certain indications where you should uh, uh, have a second thought. If a patient has had prior elbow surgery and you're not sure if they had ulnar nerve transposition, I would uh, avoid orthoscopic approach. If you think patient has an internal hardware and uh, you might wanna take that hardware out. I think an open approach is a better approach. If there's ex 
pure bony ankylosis, I would rather do an open approach. Open approach, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is uh, particularly useful uh, if patient has had prior transposition. And uh, if you're dealing with a severe deformity with exuberant osteophytes or ankylosis, open approach is preferable. Although uh, experienced orthoscopists can do uh, a severe deformity without any trouble as well. So with an elbow, open elbow contracture release, you can approach the elbow from multiple directions. You could do a lateral approach, you can do a medial approach, a posterior or an anterior approach, or a combined medial and lateral approach as well. Again, it's based on surgeon's preference. It is based on whether you wanna do an ulnar nerve decompression in a patient or not, which would uh, sway you towards doing a medial sided approach or a posterior approach. And depending upon certain peculiarities, for example, you have heterotopic ossification, more so anteriorly, and it's a pediatric patient, you might uh, wanna go anteriorly. And then if you have, have posterior hardware, prior surgical incision, which was a midline posterior, you might wanna go posterior. And then if you feel like the elbow arthritis is so bad that you're just doing it as a, a time buying operation, I would not make any further incisions on the medial or the lateral side and just go with my future elbow replacement surgery incision, which would be direct posterior. No matter what kind of approach you do, it is very important to understand the big beast in elbow is the nerve injury. And you have to protect all the vulnerable neurovascular structures listed out here. So let's uh, go over briefly uh, these approaches, which is what uh, is one of the main aims of uh, this talk. So for me, uh, the lateral column approach or the LUCL sparing approach is the go-to approach. It is good for mild to moderate contractures because most of the stiffness or arthritis typically starts from the radiocapitellar side. So you're able to address majority of the pathology from this one single incision. It is simple, safe, and it exploits uh, two intervals as you can see in this picture here. So it's like an inverted Y, if you will. The vertical limb up top separates the triceps posteriorly from the brachialis, brachioradialis, and ECRL in the front. So you can elevate these muscles off the supracondylar ridge to gain access to the front and back of the distal humerus, which includes also the olecranon fossa, which includes the radial and coronoid fossa in the front. Then distally, this limb splits into two in an inverted Y-shaped fashion. The posterior limb exploits the interval between encaneus and ECU, and that will let you access to the radiocapitellar and the posterolateral capsule. The front, which is between the ECRL and ECRB, will let you gain access more into the distal part of the joint anteriorly, like if you wanna go in and get the coronary tip with ease, you know, it'll allow you to do that. If you wanna do a radial head right section, you could do that from the front or combined from the front and the back. Limitation of this approach is that you cannot access the postromedial capsule. And if you are contemplating uh, doing an all in of release, you gotta go through a separate medial based incision. So these are typical uh, you know, intraoperative pictures that you will see. For me, I do this surgery uh, in a supine position on a hand table with a regional block. Uh, the incision for me uh, is a coker-based incision, typically five to six centimeters in length. It's not a big incision. After uh, dissecting through the subcutaneous tissue, uh, you wanna uh, make sure that you uh, don't cut the LABC. And then you get down to uh, the fascia. At this time point, I will make or mark out my inverted Y with the help of a marking pen. And then I typically start proximally in which I will decide which compartment I wanna go. I typically address the posterior compartment first, which means that I am going to lift off my triceps using a bovi, then using a cob. I'm going to lift off, as you can see in picture uh, with the label C, I will lift off the entire triceps and hinge on the medial ridge and lift off the triceps. This gives me access to the posterior capsule, the fibro fatty tissue in the olecranon fossa, the olecranon tip, 
and I can work on the olecranon fossa. I will extend this incision distally, as you see on this uh, middle panel labeled A, where I will have access to the radiocapitella joint. I will take off the posterolateral capsule. And if I need to do the radiohead resection, I can do it from here. So this will finish my posterior compartment. And then I will move on to the anterior compartment in which I will take off the brachialis, the brachioradialis, the ECRL as a single sleeve. Distally, I will extend this incision as you see in the middle panel with label edge towards the interval between ECRB and ECRL. And then I will have full access to the anterior compartment as you can see here. I typically will put cob retractor or curved blunt homen in the front. And then I will excise the capsule as a single piece. Here, you do not want to excise the capsule piecemeal. And uh, the interval between the capsule and brachialis is so easy to develop. All you need to do is just take a ratex with a hemostat and just shove it in and it will spread out for you. And then with a series of either two carbs or two curved blunt homens, you can uh, excise the capsule. You will gain access to the radio cap, uh, you'll gain access to the coronoid fossa in the depth. You, uh, the radial fossa will be more close to you. And then if you need to take the coronoid tip off, you flex the elbow, put a homen on the anterior aspect of the coronoid. And I typically use small osteotomes to do that rather than taking a burr deep inside the elbow and you don't wanna do that. This way you have addressed four things. You've taken out the capsule, you've deepened the fossa, you've taken out the loose bodies, you've done exostectomy of the coronoid and that's it. And it's a 45 to a 60 minute procedure through a small incision. Now, one thing which people oftentimes tell me that you have such a small incision, it's a tight elbow and they have a lot of difficulty seeing. So most important thing is when you're working on the back of the elbow, your elbow should be in mild extension and the shoulder should be internally rotated. That's when the surgeon will be looking at the posterior part of the humerus. Conversely, when you are addressing the anterior compartment, the elbow has to be flexed and the shoulder has to be externally rotated, then only you can gain access and have pictures just like this. So this is what a typical end range of motion that I will get most of the time, I would say 90, 95% of the time, I'm able to get full flexion and full extension on the table. And this is typically what I get out of the elbow most of the time when I'm doing an open elbow approach to a lateral based incision. Uh, then comes the medial side incision. My indication is if I have a patient where I have decided I'm gonna decompress and transpose the ulnar nerve, I'm going medially. If I have a patient who has 70, 80 degrees of uh, uh, flexion contracture, I'm going medially because I know I need to take the most posterior medial capsule out. And that happens in 15 to 20% of cases. Most of the time I'm going that way. Uh, the uh, disadvantages of uh, doing medial approach is that A, uh, it's a longer scar. The scar is very sensitive because invariably the MABC will be stretched. And uh, obviously you cannot expose and address the lateral side of pathology uh, through a medial approach. A lot of surgeons are not very comfortable or familiar with doing a medial sided approach uh, unless they are elbow trained surgeons. So I think it is less popular compared to the lateral approach. So it'll be a typical medial based incision with the apex being slightly posterior to the medial epicondyle and then extending the limb uh, proximally towards the septum, distally towards the FCU. Once you go past the subcutaneous tissue and you're right on the fascia, that's where you will see MABC. If you want to avoid them, you can make a more posteriorly based incision and that will help you see only one or at the most two of these. Once you get down to the fascia, it's your preference. You want to go anteriorly or posteriorly. For me, I start posteriorly. Just like the core cord is the lighthouse of the shoulder, for me, the medial epicondyle and the medial intermuscular septum is the lighthouse for the medial approach. If you localize the medial intermuscular septum, which is very easy to do, and the medial epicondyle, you exactly know where your nerve is. It's posterior. And you can then just pick the fascia on top of the tricep, 
just make a neck on the fascia and then you'll be able to locate the median, uh, the ulnar nerve pretty easy. I'll release the nerve, I'll get it out of the way. I'll release the medial intermuscular septum and you have to be careful for the bleeders right at the distalmost part of the septum, which are very next to the bone and easily missed. And I always use a bipolar in these cases. Then your next step is elevating the triceps off the posterior part of the humerus and you gain access to the posterior compartment. Again, you can do an olecranon exostectomy. Once you've released the nerve, you can do a postomedial capsule, which is basically at the bed of the cubital tunnel. You will take out all the osteophytes of uh, the posterior compartment and you'll deepen the olecranon fossa and you're done. Then you go to the anterior part, which is where majority of people are nervous because you've got the medium neurovascular bundle right below the flexor pronator mass. So for that, I will typically uh, start proximally, lift off the brachialis off the distal humerus shaft, and then distally, I will continue at the junction of uh, the uh, anterior four-fifth or anterior three-fourth and posterior one-fourth. This will protect my anterior band of the UCL and I can elevate it like it's shown in the middle panel and get access to an entire part of the anterior humerus. You can again take out the osteophytes, deepen the fossa, do the exostectomy and take the capsule out as a single piece. So again, that will finish up uh, the anterior and posterior compartment and you're done. And uh, this is typically, again, what I'll get out from the anterior compartment. And this is, uh, again, I use hand table, supine position. And uh, it's, again, a 45 minutes to a 60 minute procedure. I do transpose all my nerves. So a uh, posterior approach, again, uh, a utilitarian approach allows you to do both medial and lateral exposure. It's compatible with a future total elbow uh, incision. Disadvantages, big scar. Uh, it gives you a post-operative hematoma because you're doing a lot of subcutaneous dissection and seroma that can be really painful to keep training. Uh, and then uh, the other big advantage, really popular with trauma surgeons, you know, you can take your hardware out. Some people will do an okay procedure through this. So uh, open posterior approach has a lot of uh, utility, especially after a post-traumatic uh, elbow contracture. There are other approaches that I don't have much experience with, like the OFER approach, uh, and I don't do them, but they are out there. Anterior approach is typically popular with pediatric contractures. And then the OK procedure that I mentioned, again, very popular with trauma surgeons. Let's go to arthroscopic elbow release. I think uh, arthroscopic procedure is getting more and more popular with more comfort level uh, among surgeons. Uh, but I still think uh, arthroscopic approach is less forgiving then an open approach and uh, elbow arthroscopy compared to knee shoulder or uh, uh, knee shoulder arthroscopy, it is a more difficult uh, arthroscopy and there's a learning curve. So there's certain principles that one should ad adhere to when they're doing elbow arthroscopy. Time is of an essence. When you're doing a real elbow stiffness, it can take up to anywhere one and a half to two hours for doing a, a good uh, elbow scope for elbow arthritis. And you should be prepared for this. Uh, you gotta stay under the learning curve. You can't start with a severe elbow contracture. It's gonna be a mess. Uh, it's good to know open approach so that if you need to bail out, you have full comfort level. Uh, when doing arthroscopy, I usually will keep the pump pressure very low, 20 to 30 or use gravity. Never lose a portal, use switching sticks, use retractors. And I typically, when I'm working on the poster compartment, I will uh, avoid suction or shaver when I'm working close to the nerve, which is the ulnar nerve. And again, as I said, you should know how to bail yourself out. I typically do this procedure in a lateral position. And if I ever have to do an open part because uh, of the swelling or something, I, all I need to do is just uh, externally rotate my shoulder, bring in a padded Mayo stand, and I can do my open elbow approach. So uh, the surgical steps have been very well outlined by Dr. Shana Driscoll, and I think I encourage everybody to read his uh, articles. Uh, you know, typically you get into an elbow and establish a view. That's your first step. 
then you create a space. And if you look at it, this is just like doing a subacromial decompression. You get in, you get a room with a view, and then you typically in elbow start with bony work. I will, I will use a radio frequency probe. I'll ablate the surfaces so that my bony work can proceed smoothly. I typically use a four millimeter round burr with a sheath and I'll start deepening the fossa. I'll start from the radial side uh, and uh, switch to work on the ulnar side. Once I'm done with my bony work, I'll do capsulectomy. I don't do complete capsulectomy. I just do capsulectomy in front of the distal humerus uh, with, a, uh, with a radio frequency probe. And then in the end, I'll remove loose bodies. If there's small loose bodies that I can take out uh, through the same incision, I will uh, take them out initially. Otherwise, there will usually be one big loose body that I will take it out in the end because that will necessitate me to make a bigger incision or extend my incision. And I don't want to do that at the start of my case. Otherwise, I won't be able to maintain fluid pressure and uh, that thing will just be a mess. But leave working in the elbow with a loose body in front of your face is also not easy. So you could, uh, you know, burr it down a little bit and take it out. That is another option. But again, don't make a bigger incision right at the get go. So uh, let's talk a little bit about portals, which is basically the key when you're doing elbow arthroscopy apart from positioning and uh, following the general principles. So I start my elbow arthroscopy from the medial side. Uh, a typical portal for me is the proximal anteromedial portal, which is approximately one to two centimeters proximal and anterior to the medial epicondyle. Uh, before I start elbow arthroscopy, I use a tourniquet, I will inflate the joint typically from a posterior portal, but you can use a soft spot portal as well. I usually will put 10 cc's uh, and uh, then I will make uh, my proximal anteromedial portal incision. I will make sure preoperatively that patient does not have a subluxating ulnar nerve. Uh, I'll make the incision, I'll dissect with a blunt forcep down to the bone when I do that, I go in and twang the medial intermuscular septum to make sure 101%, especially in obese elbows that I'm anterior. Then I will take my scope trocar, again, go and uh, palpate the medial intermuscular septum to be 100% sure I'm gonna be anterior. And then I will aim towards the radial head and get in. If it is a severe elbow contracture, if it is a lot of foster fights, your scope sheath and trocar is going to be actually hitting those osteophytes and you'll have a tough time and you may skive off. So, you know, you got to be careful. You could use a small hemostat in those cases because it will have a, a relatively sharp pointed tip. And then you can go in and gain entry uh, into the portal, or you could use a relatively sharper, not a sharp, but not so blunt uh, switching stick in those cases, and then put your sheath on top of that. Once you enter into uh, the uh, joint, you will see egress of fluid. Then I will make uh, my anterolateral portals. I typically use two anterolateral portals. My standard anterolateral portal will be right in front of the radiocapitella joint. And that will be the portal through which I will do most of my uh, work. I will also simultaneously make a proximal anterolateral portal, which will be my switching stick portal, or sorry, my retractor portal. And uh, once I get the portals in, I will use, I typically use a cannula. It makes it easy in the initial part so that you don't lose a portal. I'll withdraw the cannula so that I just have my instrument in. And uh, my first thing is radio frequency probe, get the surfaces cleaned off any synovitis, Number two, go straight uh, with the burr, clean the fossa. If there's a loose body, take it out, small one, big one, keep it to the end. Once I'm done with that, I will do uh, my capsular excision. Once that is done, then I will put in a switching stick, switch my portals, start working from the intro, uh, proximal anteromedial portal, repeat the same steps, take out the osteophytes, take out the, uh, recreate the fossa, do the capsulectomy, and then I'm done. Typically, it'll take me anywhere between 35 to 45 minutes for the anterior compartment work. Once I'm done, then I will move on to the posterior compartment. I typically use two posterior portals. 
a direct posterior portal, which is uh, three to four centimeter proximal to the tip of the electron. Make it big, make it big when you're starting up. Uh, the most common mistake I see is making it very distal. Then the, the surgeon keeps hitting the dorsal surface of uh, the ulna and keeps thinking that he's in the electron fossa and all they see is just the triceps and fibrophatic tissue. And then being more proximal uh, lets you avoid the main tendinous portion of the triceps as well. The second portal for me is the posterior lateral portal. And that portal I make, uh, I connect uh, the tip of the olecranon to the lateral condyle and I'll uh, bisect it, go one centimeter proximal that lands me right on the lateral supracondylar uh, uh, part of the olecranon fossa. So before I start this, I actually will put a scope trocar with the sheath through the posterior portal. And I will put my shaver through the posterior lateral portal and I go in and touch them. Once I'm done with that, I'll ask my assistant to take out the trocar and put a scope in. And the initial few seconds, if I don't see anything, I'm doing bluntly. I know that I'm in the center. I know my instrument is laterally and there's no way I can go and hit the nerve. So I will start the shaver without suction and create a little room. Fibro fatty tissue can be really frustrating in the posterior compartment when you're doing uh, an elbow scope for arthritis. And if there are a lot of loose bodies, then it will be even more frustrating. In those cases, I develop some room for a view and I go with my uh, instrument uh, to take uh, the loose body out and I might take a few loose bodies out just to get a room with the view. Once you have developed a room with the view, then it's pretty easy. I will stay with my working instrument in the posterior lateral portal and debris the posterior, posterior lateral part out. This gives me some room, then I'll switch, put my scope in posterior lateral portal, then I will be working through direct central portal and I will have uh, a good idea where the nerve is, release the capsule, and then in the end, I will go to work on the olecranon fossa. So when, uh, go and work on the olecranon tip. So uh, a good pearl is that when you extend the elbow, that's where your assistant is gonna help. You will have easy time to work in the electron fossa, but you fix, if you extend too much, then the tip of the electron is gonna prevent you from working in that fossa. So five to 10 degrees of elbow extension, uh, ask the uh, assistant to extend, to make sure you're some way midway in which the electron tip is not kicking you out, but at the same time, the triceps is relaxed and you can work. When you want to work on uh, the tip of the electron, same concept, you want to extend a little bit so that you're not going to be damaging the posterior part of the trochlea and you can do the exostectomy. Once you have done this, that is when you want to go into the gutters. You don't want to go into the gutters right away. And then I don't, I don't, I don't uh, do anything on the posterior medial side, like going in and taking a posterior medial capsule or anything. I just feel like it is uh, asking for more trouble. Uh, so nerves at risk, it is uh, very important. Uh, I'm gonna go back a little bit just to show you when you're making an intramedial portal, uh, the biggest enemy is the ulnar nerve. I already told you, I'll check the septum. That helps me avoid uh, the intro, uh, the ulnar nerve. Uh, when I'm on the posterior lateral portal, uh, if you stay close to uh, the lateral epicondyle and the upper part of the radial head, you're safe. As you go proximal, you will run into the radial nerve. As you go distal, you'll run into the PIN. Posteriorly, if you go medial, you run into the ulnar nerve. If you're more posterior lateral, you are going to run into the posterior uh, antibrachial cutaneous nerve. Uh, this is what a typical elbow scope pictures will look like for me. Once you get into the compartment, as you can see, I've done the bony work first, same thing posteriorly, develop a room with a view, get the compartments, then debrief the gutters and the electron on tip. This is typically what I'll get uh, when I'm uh, doing an elbow scope. Again, you are not going to get capsule or uh, the uh, tip of the electron or the coronary because they are typically burred. Uh, uh, compared to my pictures from uh, the open uh, procedure. Uh, let's go to the release. So when do I do ulnar nerve release or transposition? If patient has preoperative ulnar neuritis symptoms or signs of ulnar compression neuropathy, I will definitely do ulnar nerve release. I could do either orthoscopic in which I'll make a small incision, 
before I begin my scope or as an open medial uh, approach or a posterior if they have had a prior surgery done. If patient has an elbow flexion less than 90, I'll do an all in nerve release uh, prophylactically whether they have all in neuritis symptoms or not. And then if patient uh, develops what is known as a delayed onset all in neuropathy, then I'm doing it uh, right after the surgery as soon as I diagnose this condition. So the options are mini open release, which is what I'll do if I'm doing prophylactically. A standard open release with transposition, which is what I'm going to do if they have symptoms of neuropathy or if they have a severe elbow contracture. Uh, Post-operative uh, treatment for me, for me, it's an outpatient procedure. Uh, some people will do a 23 hours observation or maybe an inpatient if they plan to use CPM. I, do, I don't use CPM. I do it under a regional block. Uh, for me, physical therapy starts uh, the day after surgery. Patients uh, in the preoperative workup will be uh, scheduling the therapy up front, and it continues for a good three to six months. Uh, in the later half, it's mainly home exercise program. And as I mentioned, I don't use CPM. It is controversial. There isn't a randomized control trial that demonstrates that CPM is superior to uh, a home exercise program or a supervised physical therapy, and not all centers in the U.S. do it. HO prophylaxis, don't, no definite guidelines. I typically do endo, endomethacin 25 TID or a sustained release for three weeks. I have rarely ever used low beam, uh, low dose external beam radiation. It is indicated for me only if patient has a history of HO, or they have had a prior elbow surgery and have developed an HO, otherwise I'm not using this. And uh, typically the radiation therapy folks at my hospital are pretty good once I tell them they take care of it. There's rarely anything I have to do. They decide if they wanna do before or after, typically within 72 hours, and uh, they do a very a collimated uh, uh, low dose radiation. Drain is optional. I used to use drain when I started out, but uh, I rarely ever use a drain, unless I'm doing a big posterior uh, approach in, in a patient with a prior incision. Outcomes, elbow contracture release, it's a fun operation. It's very predictable. Patients are very happy, but you have to set the expectations. It is a pain relieving operation, very predictable, but the pain that it responds to is the pain at the extremes of range of motion. Even they may not recover complete range of motion, but the pain relief is very predictable. As far as range of motion is concerned, flexion extension, very predictable to return. Supination, pronation, not so. So if I see a patient who has a severe supination, pronation abnormality or stiffness, I'll tell him like, listen, this is gonna be not, you're not gonna get much out of this unless I do a radial head resection or things like that. But flexion extension, even if uh, I've seen, if, even if your surgery uh, was not the way you want it to, so you still will be surprised how much uh, improvement in range of motion you are going to get. Typically, gain is 40 to 50, which means you're gonna uh, divide that 20 in flexion, 20 in extension. I invariably, not in every case, but majority of cases will get complete extension and complete flexion as I showed in pictures. Those are my routine pictures. Every patient gets those pictures after surgery <clears throat> so that they know that this is the type of range of motion that they got in trough and that gives them an encouragement and a goal to set so that they aim for that. You will typically lose 30 to 40% range of motion during the recovery process, but most of patients will achieve 60 to 80% of what I obtained in the operating room. These uh, gains persist for you know, at least a decade, uh, if not uh, less, but uh, younger patient, adolescent patients will have issues uh, uh, gaining those, uh, uh, maintaining those range of motion. As far as complications are concerned, I think it's more notorious with orthoscopic procedure where complications have come into light. Nerve injury, which is more pronounced with orthoscopic procedures, there's a wide range depending upon uh, your experience, zero to 14%. And a lot more, if you're doing lateral approach, it's uh, very, very less likely to bang a nerve. Uh, most common nerve injured is all a nerve followed by radial and then the cutaneous nerves. Uh, majority of nerve injuries recover and the risk factor is a severe elbow contracture and I think doing an arthroscopic procedure. Wound drainage, um, especially from the lateral portal, uh, when you do arthroscopy, it's a very subcutaneous portal. 
a wound hematoma or a seroma, if you're doing a posterior approach, uh, you can have uh, seromas uh, that may require either office drainage or taking to the operating room. Intraoperative fracture, if you're doing manipulation, especially if a patient has a mechanical block. Patient has big osteophytes and uh, obliteration of fossa, and you're doing uh, 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 manipulation under anesthesia, at some point you'll torque, and that torque in an older person is good enough to give you a spiral fracture. Uh, instability, more so in open procedure, if you're being uh, very overzealous and uh, are doing just a circumferential release, I don't think I've seen many cases. And then recurrence of mechanical symptoms. If you're doing an arthroscopic procedure and you fail to remove those loose bodies just because they were in the gutters, you know, you're going to have a patient who comes back and say like, hey, I never had pain, I had mechanical symptoms, I still have them. Ulnar nerve, I think in last decade or so, the role of ulnar nerve and its significance in elbow stiffness has uh, come a long way. Uh, I think people have recognized that the presence of an occult neuritis or a post-operative neuritis can result in sudden deterioration of your post-operative function. So there is an entity called delayed onset ulnar nerve, ulnar neuropathy. And it is typically seen after an orthoscopic procedure. Uh, it, is, it has three uh, sub-variants. Uh, one, the one which you should remember is called the rapidly progressive type. It develops within first few weeks after release. And it is a rapidly progressive sensory motor neuropathy and uh, severe pain in the cubital tunnel with loss of range of motion. And this is an entity that you should recognize because it has uh, a remarkable recovery if you take the patient to the operating and do a release, I usually will do uh, uh, a transposition as well. So I just had a case uh, two months ago with this. Uh, the presentation was actually three months out after an orthoscopic release uh, and the uh, patient was recovering pretty, patient was doing really well in uh, PT, uh, recovering almost like 60 to 70% of range of motion and then you know, within a week, patient starts complaining of uh, severe pain in the cubital tunnel, sensory symptoms, uh, you know, started having weakness uh, in uh, the first dorsal intraosei and started losing range of motion. There was COVID epidemic going on uh, in New York and the, uh, it took him like a week or two uh, to get to me. And uh, once, uh, you know, we recognized it immediate, uh, I did an EMG on the same day, not me, but my uh, neurology colleague, and we took him to the OR within three days. And, uh, you know, within two weeks, within two weeks, when he comes for suture removal, a different person uh, with uh, complete loss of pain, uh, you know, recovering sensory symptoms and, uh, you know, range of motion at that time was gradually improving. Again, the risk factors are excessive HO preoperatively, presence of neurologic symptoms preoperatively. And in those patients, I think a prophylactic cubital tunnel release is indicated. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for patient listening. I know it kind of uh, was flying through, but if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you, Mandeep, uh, for that excellent lecture. I mean, there's a lot of new stuff for a lot of people around the world. Uh, a few questions. Yeah. Uh, see, someone who wants to begin an elboscopy, uh, for example, if you look at the knee, you have a viewing portal, which is anterolateral, and a working portal. In general, it's anteromedial. And so someone who wants to start elbow arthroscopy, uh, because there are so many portals that you have described. I know it's all described in the literature. So someone who wants to start off, how would you recommend? I think the ideal case as well, because I think elbow stiffness is one of the most difficult cases, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. So what I would recommend, number one, you should go and spend some time with somebody who does elbow scope. You know, the elbow arthroscopy starts from elbow positioning. I didn't go much into it, but if you don't have a good elbow holder, I think the elbow holder has to be one which sits here, which gives you full access to this part of the elbow, whether you do prone position or lateral position. You got to make sure that your elbow can flex completely you got to make sure that you have good room in order to get into. But I'm not going to go much into detail there, and I'm going to answer your question. So go and spend some time with somebody who does elbow arthroscopy. Practice in a cadaver. Scoping skills, no matter where you do, can never be achieved by reading a textbook. Open approach, yes. You can read a book, read an approach, and it's surprising you can do it. Number two, pick a simple case. The simplest case, 
will be a patient who does not have much arthritis, typically a young patient with one loose body. That is the case where you go in, you know that you, you, even if you don't have much skill set, you can take that out or a tennis elbow. So you start with those. And then as far as portals are concerned, keep it simple. One medial portal, typically a proximal anteromedial portal to gain access into the elbow. One simple anterolateral portal, one centimeter proximal or right across the radiocapitella joint, slightly proximal. Practice those two portals. Once you get those two portals, your anterior compartment scope is all done. And then when you get into advanced cases, you can do portals like retractor portal and things like that. For posterior portal, again, keep it simple. One direct central portal and one posterior lateral portal. So if I have to sum it up, total four portals and you'll be able to do majority of stuff. And then as you gain experience, you wanna do a soft spot portal, you wanna address uh, osteochondral lesions, those are harder cases. And you can do more damage than help a patient. And similarly, you know, if you wanna do elbow arthritis, I would start with a very simple case, a case where pain is predominantly present, but when you look at an x-ray, you say like, hey, I don't see much of osteophyte, I'm gonna put in a scope, and I'm gonna clean up things and I'm gonna be staying under my learning curve and I gradually progress. Lastly, you should always, always know how to approach the elbow from lateral, medial and posterior side. And uh, that will be a good bailout. A lot of people start posteriorly. If they feel elbow scope is not for them, they'll extend that incision. You don't have to change the position of the patient. You could do an okay procedure or you could go from medial lateral side and bail out. I think that that's what I would do for a beginner. Uh, thank you, Mandi. Uh, the other question is regarding the lateral portal. Now, can we say that a simple method like you mark the Anconius triangle, for example, you mark the radial head, the uh, typical olecranon, and the lateral epicondyle, and that can help in uh, getting the lateral portal very easily? Yeah, so that's the soft spot portal. So you can do the soft spot portal. There isn't much room to work with the soft spot portal. So, uh, you know, that's good. That's where we drain stuff. You know, that's where you inject stuff and you can gain access to that. That will take you to the posterior part of the capitellum and to the top of the radial head. And, uh, you know, it's difficult because you have to go and debride in order to gain access into that portal. And that can be difficult. But the standard anterolateral portal is you feel the radial head, you feel the lateral epicondyle, and if you run your finger, it just falls into that spot. And that will be uh, the way to do. I feel I wanna know my enemy. And knowing my enemy is the medial side first. So I make the portal on the medial side. You know, Dr. Steinman, who's a, a very experienced surgeon, orthoscopist, who, you know, one of my mentors, he goes from lateral side. He makes his lateral portal first and then uses a switching stick. He feels that, uh, you know, going from the lateral side, there's no way you can hit the nerve because the nerve is a posterior structure. Unless you are super skilled, even then you can't hit. So that's how he makes his portals. So for, I mean, that Anconi's triangle approach, I mean, you can still start off with that, isn't it? Yeah, you can start if uh, you think that you're doing an OCD, if you're doing a posterior compartment, you can start with that. I, I think there's no harm in it, but it's a difficult portal to initiate. Okay. The other one is uh, you mentioned about uh, the ulna nerve uritis. Yeah. So do you think uh, when we are trying to achieve a lot of flexion, for example, if you're trying to achieve more than 90 degree flexion, you have a high incidence because you're manipulating a bit too much. The chance of neuropraxia is more. Or in your slide, you mentioned actually. If you have loss of extension, that is, and presence of HO, your chance of having an ulnar neuritis is going to be higher. So it's a great question. So uh, thanks for bringing this up. So if you look at the indication for an ulnar nerve release, it is flexion less than 100. So I know that this patient, when I do their release, their elbow is going to bend more. And in flexion, the ulnar nerve drapes around the medial epicondyle more. So in order to do a release intraoperatively, I am making a decision based on flexion. But for delayed onset ulnar nerve release, it's opposite. I'm saying people who have loss of extension are more predisposed 
to delayed onset organ nerve release. That's what they found. Or patients who have a prior history of HO. And uh, it is contradicting, but I think uh, that's basically what uh, this uh, finding is. So for me, even though a patient who has 70, 80, or 90 degrees of elbow flexion contracture, I am never able to get, go past 130 or 140. And in those patients, their recovery of range of motion is very slow. And I think that's what protects having that much ulnar neuritis symptoms. I still I look back at my cases and it said that I didn't do ulnar nerve release in every patient who had a flexion contracture less than 100, which is typically my indication for doing 100 to 120 is majority of my patients. Few patients are less than 100. And I think that's the reason why not every case with elbow flexion contracture of 100 degrees or less will not present with a post-op ulnar neuritis symptoms. But delayed onset ulnar neuritis is basically a sudden deterioration of function and rapidly progressive variant, which I think uh, could be related to, and it is only seen in arthroscopic. Isn't that crazy? You don't see that in open. So that's why I think it's a pathology that we don't understand, but we know how to identify and treat it. And I think that's where uh, the real uh, lesson is as of now. It's something like the ischemic optic neuropathy that you've seen in prone positioning in spine surgery. You have yeah. a severe damage after a surgery. Yeah. The other thing is, Mandeep, uh, see, are, do you prefer an open procedure over an arthroscopic in any particular scenario? Yeah, if, you, if a patient has had a prior, prior cubital tunnel release, you know, there is a technique described arthroscopically, but I don't want to take that risk. You know, there's certain things that are not forgiving in orthopedics. Vascular injury, you can have a vascular surgeon who can come in, do a bypass and do stuff. And if you don't develop ischemia, you dodge the bullet. Nerve injury, no matter who comes in, you are at the mercy of mother nature. So you, A, need to know the enemy and you need to know the price. You know, if a patient did not get complete correction, you know, you can still have a relationship with a patient and have somebody else do another procedure and you can have a happy ending. You do a procedure where you give patient a scenario or a problem that is worse than the original problem. He or she is not gonna come back to you and definitely you're gonna see the repercussion. So that's how I take care of uh, my philosophy where I say like, I don't need to be a hero. I just need to be a guy who's helping the patient with uh, minimal risk and maximum benefit. So I do elbow arthroscopy. I do a fair bit of elbow arthroscopies. And uh, I think uh, my comfort level is good, but if I have any, any reason not to do it, for example, if I'm uh, initially, when I did elbow scopes, if patient had all the neuritis symptoms, I would do it open. And then slowly I, you know, during my fellowship, I realized that you can make an incision, mark it out, go down to the subcutaneous tissue and onto the cubital tunnel, but don't release the nerve. Or you could release the nerve and do your elbow arthroscopy through that big incision and you will be done in the end, but don't do the scope and then do an open cubital tunnel release after the scope. The elbow will be swollen. You can't even palpate the medial epicondyle and you're more likely to do damage. So in a, in a previously operated cubital tunnel, you're, you're not planning for oscopy at all, is it? Yeah, I, I know. First of all, most of these patients don't know whether they had an ulnar nerve release or not. You could get an ultrasound, you can get an MRI, but why? Just do open. Okay. And is there any other similar scenario, for example, a lot of HO or any other scenario where you don't want yeah, to... Yeah, you know... You know, I just, one of my friends sent a video. Uh, he was doing uh, HO with arthroscopy. He's brave. I would do HO open. Uh, I would do, uh, if I have a distal humerus plate, I'm going to be there taking it out. Why do an open and then take that plate out? And uh, if I'm doing radio head resection, you can do arthroscopic. It's not hard. But uh, if I want to move quick, I have other things to do. I'll do open as well. But hard and fast for me is prior cubital tunnel release. Hard and fast for me is uh, if uh, there is uh, 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 hardware inside and uh, you know, scope becomes uh, difficult. There's a lot of glare. What you're looking 
So in elbow scope, everything is opposite, you know, compared to other scopes. And that's why it is hard. Now, if you put a metal in it, which is giving you a reflection, your head is going to spin. Okay. Uh, Senthil is also in the Zoom room. Senthil is a staff orthopedic surgeon in Dallas, Texas. Senthil, your questions to Mandeep. Mandeep, it's a great presentation. So I know advanced, shoulder elbow arthroscopy is an advanced skill. And a lot of uh, elbow stiffness patients go to general orthopedic surgeons, especially uh, outside North America. So for a general orthopedic surgeon trying to treat elbow uh, stiffness, is there an advantage of learning the arthroscopic skill or can they stick to the open? Like in shoulder, we know the UCAF studies shows there is no difference between open and arthroscopy. So what's the data in elbow? Can, why, why is it? I, so the learning curve that, is pretty steep. I think for a guy who is not, who's learning elbow arthroscopy just to do elbow stiffness. I don't know how many cases he's gonna see in a year. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, he needs to have a very strong interest. It's doable, it's doable. He needs to find a person, as I said, gotta go through the rigor morale. You gotta find a person who does elbow scope, does them as a living, and uh, then they can do it. But I don't think, uh, outcome wise there is uh, in any way shape or form a feeling that elbow scope uh, elbow open elbow is inferior but i think there's definitely less morbidity patient doesn't know what was done inside they they, they see scar for them two scars tiny scars they're very happy you give them a bigger scar they feel like it was a big surgery so i think for a general orthopedic surgeon mastering open elbow techniques is far, far easier compared to open or compared to orthoscopic. But if they have interest, they can definitely learn it. And then they need to make sure that they keep their, maintain their skill. So, you know, for me uh, in my practice, shoulder, elbow, my elbow is just 10%. And I'm a guy who's at a tertiary level referral center. So you can imagine a general orthopedic surgeon will have a tough time finding these cases. That's right. Uh -huh. So that's good. Uh, Hitesh, I don't have any more questions. Do you have any more questions? Okay, uh, yeah, I think that's all the questions that we have. Yeah, Mandeep has spent a lot of time with us. Thank you, Mandeep, for this wonderful presentation and going to be useful for thousands of people all over the world. And we are indeed very, very grateful to you to come online and uh, give this fantastic presentation. And we really look forward for one more on a later date, whenever you have time. I know that you're too busy with your work and we look forward to for one more meeting with you. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk. And I hope it was not boring. Thank you very much, Mandi. All right. Thank you, Mandi. We'll end the session.